Welcome to the Ecom Breakthrough Podcast. Are you ready to unlock the full potential and growth in your business? You've already crossed seven figures in sales, but the challenge is knowing how to take your business to the next level. Join Josh Hadley, an eight-figure e-com business owner and investor, as he interviews highly successful business owners. Get ready, because you're going to learn specific actions you can take today to help your business reach its full potential and leave a lasting impact on the world. Welcome to the Ecom Breakthrough Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Hadley, where I interview the top business leaders in e-commerce. Today, I'm speaking with Matt Altman of Right Side Up, and we will be talking a lot about launching new products, product optimization, and PPC management. Past guests of this of this podcast include Kevin King, Stephen Pope, and Steve Simonson. Feel free to check out those past episodes. This episode is brought to you by Ecom Breakthrough Consulting, where I help seven-figure companies grow to eight figures and beyond. Listen, Matt, I started Hadley Designs back in 2015 and grew it to an eight-figure brand in seven years. However, I made a lot of mistakes along the way that made the path to getting to eight figures take a lot longer than it probably should have. There were times where I had a lot of self-doubt, where I you know, struggled with feelings of, do I have a real brand or could I be a successful business leader? I wish I would have had a guide along the way to help me overcome those stumbling blocks and also move faster. If you've hit the same plateaus and you want to know the next steps to take to take your business to the next level, then go to ecombreakthrough.com, that's ecom with two M's, to learn more. And as a special bonus to my podcast listeners, this month I'm giving away one $10,000 comprehensive business strategy audit session for free. Email me at josh at ecombreakthrough.com with the subject line strategy audit and tell me why you think you should win the free strategy audit for this month. And don't worry if you don't win this month, you'll be entered in for future months to come. Today, I'm super excited to introduce you to Matt Altman. Matt leads the marketplace at Right Side Up. Matt has over 12 years of selling experience. He's launched and sold multiple personal brands, all starting from a retail arbitrage budget. Four years ago, he started an agency, Right Side Up, to help high-growth CPG brands focus on dominating the marketplace. They've been able to scale many brands from zero to three million in monthly sales. Welcome to the podcast, Matt. Oh, thanks for having me, Josh. How are you doing? Doing great. Super excited to have you on the podcast. I know we met at the Billion Dollar Seller Summit uh, a couple months ago, and you know we hit it off in terms of talking about PPC management. At the time, we were switching over from an agency that we were formerly working with to bringing PPC in house, and you had a you were a wealth of wisdom, uh, and I I know that that wisdom runs deep in in your knowledge base, and so. I'm super excited to have you on the podcast. I know our listeners are going to be uh, excited to hear from your experience, how you've been able to exit multiple brands and how you've been able to really take other brands from zero to three million. So let's back all of that up, Matt. And why don't you just kind of walk me through your journey? It sounds like you started there in retail arbitrage, right? Yeah. um, So like 12 years ago, um, basically moved to L.A. and was working in commercial real estate. Absolutely hated every minute of it Um, and really just kind of fell into it. Um, Saw something on YouTube one day and just dove deep into it, was buying a lot of clearance items at like Target and Walmart and things like that for a few years. And then parlayed that into my own products back then. You could honestly sell anything on Amazon. It it wasn't that hard. You just had to be kind of that first mover, get some reviews and you're good to go. Um, So did that for a while until we just started getting knocked off on everything that we were releasing and we we couldn't compete with some of the the shady things that people were doing to our products or their own products to boost them up. So then we got into uh, supplements, which is where I've kind of been for the last like five, six years now, Um, mainly just because we we know we actually have to have some certifications there. It's a little bit harder to... um, like get into as a foreign seller and things like that. But obviously supplements is super competitive and we have our own other issues in that category now. Yeah, no, super impressive. Yeah, I know there's a lot of barriers to entry there in the supplement space and and there is a lot of good competition. But because of that, I think you know, you know, how to compete, how to make an offer stand out. And if you can succeed in the supplement space, I'd argue you could probably succeed 
in any of the other spaces there on Amazon. So tell me a couple of the brands that you exited from, you know, when were those exits? How did you get them, you know, to that point? Yeah. So uh, unfortunately for me, the ones that I did exit, I sold before the huge aggregator gold rush. Uh, so my, my multiples were, were nothing compared to what they were. Um, but the, the first one was, uh, really just generic men's products. Um, so we had like some beard brushes, some like straight razors, different things like that. Uh, really sold that one just because we saw where the category was going. Um, we were seeing new listings pop up every other day and then there were thousands of reviews on them within a month and we're just like, nah, we don't want to be in this. Um, so sold it privately to someone that was interested. Uh, actually, I haven't even looked at it in like seven years, so I have no idea what they're even doing now. Um, but very glad we got out of that one because it's definitely dying. Uh, the other one was actually interesting, though. So when I was in commercial real estate, I met a a doctor at the time who had a bunch of patents on products and we were um, just going back and forth and like he, he loves creating products, but didn't really want to be involved in marketing or selling them in any capacity. And then come to find out he had quite a few patents that he's just never done anything with. Um, so basically bought them out from him, whipped up some products around those patents and grew that for about four years and then uh, sold that off. And those were all kind of in like the, uh, I would say like medical, like remedy space. Um, so we didn't need like FDA approval or anything, but there were certain patents he had on how to make the formulas that basically made it so that no one else could knock us off. So that, that one got really a pretty cool. great multiple. Yeah. 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 So yeah, I, I, to that point, you know, we had formerly Rich Goldstein on the podcast, right? I, IP lawyer. Mm -hmm. He had talked so much about, you know, IP being able to, you know, increase your multiples when it came time to exit. So I guess it sounds like that came to fruition here. Correct. Yeah. And actually one of the companies, so we, we split off, we had two different brands under that one. Um, one of the companies that made the purchase, they ended up using that patent on other products that they had already been um, selling to kind of make those stronger as well. So adds a, a ton of value on the back end. Fascinating. Yeah, that, that makes a lot more sense. Well, that's great. Well, it sounds like you've had experience, you know, working with some IP intellectual property products and then just some generic products. And then so what got you into the supplement space then? Um, strangely enough, it was a friend of mine that was in the space selling, um, saw that he was doing extremely well, which I, I couldn't figure out. Like I thought I was selling well on Amazon at the time, but Obviously, my items aren't replenishable. Um, your subscribe and saves aren't massive. Your margins aren't massive. Uh, I mean, back then in supplements, margins were absolutely insane. Um, and really just kind of figured, hey, I'm going to have to put in the same amount of work no matter what products I do. I'd rather gain a customer for 12 to 16 months versus a one-time purchase. You don't have to work as hard and let that continue to multiply as much as possible. Yeah. No, I, I think there's a lot of truth to that, being able to have repeat purchases, subscribe and save, replenishable products, definitely are the, the sweet spot there on Amazon. So let's dive in a little bit more to that, Matt. You've got a lot of experience launching new products on Amazon. You you have a lot of experience optimizing products on Amazon. So let's talk about, you know, when you get into the supplement space or we can just talk broadly on Amazon itself. What are some of the key things that you you advise or recommend when launching a brand new product on Amazon that are working today? Because as you know, a lot of those black hat tactics, you know, have, have come and gone. Uh, you also yeah. have the, you know, the rebates that everybody was doing. And, and now it's kind of leveled the playing field a little bit more. Tell me what you're doing that's been working for you guys. Yeah, so... First off, I think that the biggest thing is making sure you have a big enough budget to launch your products. Um, like the the days of five to ten thousand dollar budgets to launch products are just gone in my eyes, at least in the spaces that I work in. Um, so we usually overestimate our budgets by like twenty to thirty percent of what we actually think it would be, just to make sure that we're in a good place in case it doesn't go the way that we want it to. Um, but 
Outside of that, we're, we're looking for a couple of major things. Uh, one is we want to see continued growth in the category. Amazon's making that way easier now with like the search query reports, the product opportunity explorer. There, there's so many internal tools that they're giving you access to now that you can really easily find that. And then the other big thing that we're looking for is categories that you've got maybe like three or four power players in and by power players they aren't really doing that much they're still kind of growing but they're ahead of like the other 20 items there um really it just kind of is showing us that hey there, there's enough sales to go around if these four people can all kind of be around the same and customers really don't care which one they're choosing right now they're just basically picking whichever one's at the top from what we can see so yeah, um, we used to go into very heavy, like, categories where you would just, I mean, like, launches would be a half a million to a million dollars. Wow. Um, and if you could make them work, yeah, the, the payback is amazing because of the volume that some of those categories do. But if you lose, like, it, is, it absolutely sucks. Um, so <laughs> For sure. We're looking at like fifty to seventy five thousand uh, dollars to launch a product right now in the, the supplement space that we're kind of going after. Um, and we've seen it, it's kind of the sweet spot for everything. Um, so if we do find a product and we think it's going to cost more than that to actually launch it, we'll hold off for a bit and see if we can find some other ones that are within our kind of thresholds. That makes sense. So yeah. how do you estimate, you know, that budget, right? What's the difference between a half a million to a million dollar product launch budget <laughs> versus something that's 50 to $75,000? And how do you estimate that? Yeah, so the the biggest thing is ads. I mean, we've really in the last like three months, all of our launches have been almost exclusively on Amazon through Amazon ads. Um, so we're pulling averages of cost per clicks through the advertising API and really just looking at, OK, what is the conversion rate of the top products? If we wanted to spend to get that conversion rate on that keyword, like what would it cost us per day and working that backwards? Um, the other big thing that I don't know anyone else that's kind of touched on this, but what, we, what we've what we been doing here recently is we have a seller account where we'll create the product beforehand. It's not the product that we're actually going to sell. We'll put some items as merchant fulfilled, and then we'll just have ourselves buy the products. So that way we get all the search query report data for that product before we actually launch it. Oh, that's that's fascinating. So you do that in a separate account then? Is that what you're saying? We've been doing it in the same account, just um, okay. like a different brand name um, and throw up a listing merchant fulfilled and do a couple buys through it. And then you get all that data. Interesting. OK, mm -hmm. so then you're going for, for the search query performance reports from Amazon, right? And Correct. What are the additional data points that you get from the search query performance that you wouldn't get? normally just looking at brand analytics, right? Yeah, so really the, the big things we focus on are, you obviously get the, the add to cart, the click through rates, the overall impression rates, things like that, but taking those out and breaking them down, like a lot of people always kind of go by that old method of, I need this many buys per keyword per day, and they were just like, oh, we need to add in some add to carts here and there to make it all look kosher. Um, through the search query report, you can basically know exactly how many add to carts you need, how many detail page views you need. Um, and then you can equate that out to the exact same for the top sellers if you marry the brand analytics data into it. And basically, it'll tell you exactly you've got to hit between these three numbers each day for we've been seeing like 25 to 30 days is how long we usually like launch on a certain keyword. And then you'll pretty much stay ranked like we, we haven't really had any issues. Interesting. Okay, so you're targeting specific keywords right out of the gate, right? So if we drive, you know, dive a little deeper here, mm -hmm. if you, you're launching a particular product, you've probably got hundreds of keywords that you could focus on, right? Yep. But are you coming out with auto campaigns and broad campaigns from the get-go? Like, tell us, you know, what type of ad campaigns you're launching, how many keywords are you focusing on in, in that? Yeah, so for the first like 35 to 40 days, we launched two campaigns. Um, th there might be more than two campaigns. It depends on the, the volume of the exact match terms that you're going after. If they're super high volume, we'll break those keywords out to just let it spend a little bit more uh, efficiently. 
but really the main focus is taking those top keywords for that product um, as long as our budget can withstand them. Usually we always go for the top ones. We've seen, yeah, you can go for the long tail ones. You can extend this launch out and it may take you 90, 120 days to get to where you want to go to, but we'd rather spend the budget up front and get there as quickly as possible. Um, but what we do is set up exact match campaigns. We set the bid at the um, suggested bid from Amazon, and then we put in a 300% top of search modifier. Um, basically, we wait two to three days, uh, pull the data out, and uh, we're, we're using PackView right now to do this, but you can easily do this in just a bulk sheet if you want to do that. Um, but we're pulling out that data, and then we're comparing our conversion rates on products, um, or sorry, not on products, on keywords, uh, by the brand analytics data day by day to see kind of, are we matching the brand analytics, like conversion rate or sales rate? And if we are, we keep spinning against that keyword. If we aren't, we decrease the bid. And then we basically just keep doing that every two to three days. We don't worry about ACOS. We don't worry about tacos. We don't worry about anything except for our conversion rate. As long as our conversion rate is within two percentage points of the brand analytics conversion rate for the top couple people, we keep running that keyword until we are either ranked in the top three or we just fall off completely because Amazon didn't find us relevant. Um, and then the second campaign that we launch is a sponsor product campaign as well, but we do ASIN targeting and basically we'll take those five to seven keywords that we're targeting in our launch. And we use ecom analytics for this, but you can do it um, through the API or brand analytics yourself. Um, but we pull the weekly data going back for the last uh, 12 months and we target any ASIN that's ever been in the top three for the five to seven keywords that we're going after. And, we're hoping that that gives us relevancy towards those keywords as well. And those other products that are converting well for those keywords. Fascinating. I love that. Yeah. I, I don't think I've heard that kind of tactic or approach to PPC, especially when it comes to launching new products ever. I think, you know, everybody's like, Oh, create a million exact match campaigns or create, you know, your auto campaign and then start filtering out your keywords from there. So I love this approach because you're so focused just on the conversion rate. And so to dive into that a little bit more, Matt, when you're focused on the conversion rate and for the particular campaign that you're set up, right, you have one campaign that has all of your exact matches mm -hmm. in there, right? So how many like keywords would you put into a single campaign? And is there any limit to the number of keywords that you're putting into that campaign to begin with? Yeah, so for us, we, we typically launch on five to 10 keywords. Most of the time, it's between five to seven. Um, anything okay. else than that, you you can launch on keywords, but you're not going to like move the needle. You're going to pick up like five extra organic sales a week, which isn't going to help you rank for other keywords. So we, we really focus just on those top moving ones. The main thing that we really look at, and we compete a lot in kind of like the healthier for you foods, so like the, the keto foods, the like low carbs, all of that. Um, keto snacks gets like half a million searches a month. If you put that keyword in an exact match campaign with other keywords, it's just going to gobble up all of the budget. And Right. Yeah. All the impressions go to that one keyword, right? Correct. So do you separate that out if you do want to run that as a separate campaign yep. or keyword? So so usually if the keywords are over um, 20 to 30,000 searches per month, um, we'll go ahead and separate them out into their own campaigns. Um, try and keep every campaign under about 50,000 total searches. We've, we've tested this as well, where we've left them in the same campaigns, but just increased the budget to like $20,000 a day instead of $1,000 a day. We still see the same thing happen um, where that one keyword gets most of the budget and it won't even spend yeah. all the budget. Um, so we, we really don't know uh, why it does that. So we just separate them out to keep it easier. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So tell me what happens then if, to a product if you're launching on a particular keyword and you're not getting the conversion rates that are higher. You know, let's say you're 5%, the, the main conversion rate, right, for the top three seems to average around 10 to 15%. Let's say yep. yours is at 7%. What do you do at that point? Maybe we move into a little bit of product optimization here, but tell us like what's your approach at that point? Yeah, so we do two different things. Uh, the, the first one is we pull our impression share report and we're just looking 
how how often are we appearing for this keyword? Um, is there room to increase our bids and try and get a higher conversion rate by being at the top more frequently? Uh, a lot of times you'll see that's the answer and we just increase our top of search placement on that keyword by 100% or whatever it is until we start to see more impressions and see what happens to our overall uh, conversion rate. The second piece is exactly what you said. We would then take out our product. We would look at what everyone else's products are in the top three for those keywords and then we would basically send it off to like a pick foo or different um, services like that and just get analysis from people that are in the market for the product and see if there's anything we can do to really tailor our product more for that keyword. Interesting. So you are, are you t testing like main images or are you just testing like the overall idea of the product and just trying to get feedback on pick? Yeah. Foo? So we're, we're testing main images um, and titles okay. sometimes. So a lot of times what we've seen is just by adding that keyword closer to the beginning of your title so it appears on mobile could be enough to make the conversion. Um, other times, like a lot of our, our snacks or items that we're selling, like there's these benefits that you don't really get across until the second or third image. So we'll we'll change the way the box looks or we'll, we'll add something over the wrapper. Like it, it's not really there. We're just seeing if, hey, if we add like, Mm -hmm. One one net carb to the outside of this package on the main image does that increase the click through rate for low carb snacks and things like that? Uh, most of the time, what we've seen is yes, that's usually like the one thing that changes it is changing the image because if anything, we've seen no one really reads the titles that we've been changing. It doesn't <laughs> do much conversion rate wise, but images kill it. Even if you add text to the image, people are more likely to read the image from what we've seen. And are you just focused? exclusively on the main image or are you you know i guess how important obviously the main image is what gets you the click through right like how mm -hmm. are you differentiate differentiating yourself in the market but like how important are those secondary images or are they kind of the same thing where it's like well nobody actually reads those right what are yeah. your kind of thoughts there yeah, so we really focus mainly on that that primary image more than anything um and then the second and third image we really don't start changing those until we're kind of like, I would say, almost finished with our initial kind of ranking campaign. Mm. Um, the only thing I would say to this, though, is we've been getting this a lot here recently. I'm not getting it today, but where the first and second image are appearing now in search. And like you can kind of if you hover over it, it will flip between the two. Interesting. Um, so we've been testing if we do see that pop up like bigger call outs on our second image to try and at least be be readable in search because I've seen a lot of times where people try and do this in search and the text is so small by the time it's actually there, it's it's not even worth putting it there. Yeah, especially if somebody's on a phone, right? And they're exactly just browsing on a mobile device. Yeah, that, that's going to show really small. Somebody has a infographic with lots of text on it. It's like it's not even going to be readable, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Amazon's always testing out stuff. That's that's great insight. I don't think I've come across that one yet, but. I'll have to I'll have to go take a look now after this. Yeah, we've we've actually seen some autoplay video ones as well here recently on mobile. So th there's a a lot that's going on in that space. Yeah. So with that, then Matt, um, I, I've got my my brain's just filling with <laughs> ideas. You've already dropped so much knowledge here. Um, I love it. Going back to the main image because that is so important, right? Your primary image. That's where you're going to drive a lot of your click through rate. It's how you're going to set yourself out amongst the competition what are some of the things that you've done to that main image to increase those conversions you you talked about you know applying a label around maybe a product package even though it's not actually on that particular package you're just photoshopping it in what are some of the other things that you've been able to do that have worked successfully as you've tested this out multiple times yeah, I think the the biggest thing for us and um, what we have VAs do, they actually do this quite a bit. We have a, a tool, I'm actually blanking on the name right now, but it'll search a keyword and basically take a, a full page uh, screenshot of that keyword every day. And then they're kind of looking and seeing what products come into the first page of search for that keyword. And we aren't really caring what products come in. We're caring what that main image looks like. Like we, we compete a lot in the keto bar space. Almost everyone in the keto bar, like if you search keto bars, you're going to see a bar and then a box behind it. And it's just like, okay, they're all exactly the same. All the same. Um, so what can we do to, to stand out as a whole from that? And 
really just get that click through as quickly as possible. Um, and you'll see a lot of people like breaking terms of service and putting like flavor call outs where they put like bits of chocolate and different things like that. It's just, you can play that game, but you're going to get caught at some point. We'd rather just change the actual like packaging of the product a little bit in the image and a lot less likely to get like flagged by Amazon internally. Um, yeah. But we, we mess with the colors. We mess with making certain text things bigger, really all different types of things because like at the end of the day, I've learned we have no idea what the, what the heck's going to convert. Like I don't, I, I, we sell keto products. That's like our best seller of one of like my personal brands. And I don't even eat keto foods. I've never, I did the keto diet <laughs> once for like a month and that was it. So I'm not the end customer. I don't yeah. exactly know what I want to see. Um, I'm just putting up what like market research tells me. And Nine times out of 10, we've found that a lot of those market research studies like those people are, are lying or just like filling it out nonchalantly to, to get paid on the Internet. So we, yeah. we test everything. Nice. And yeah. mainly through PickFu then or you're um, just saying PickFu and to get started. Right. And then you so, throw it on Amazon and see what sticks. Yeah, so PickFu, we actually don't use PickFu. We haven't used it in a, a really long time. Um, okay. They're the one of the easiest to like get things up and going. Uh, there's another one out there that just launched called Intellivy that I think is pretty amazing as well because they go a bit further where you can add in like all of your top competitors and they'll make it look like an Amazon search results. And mm. then you get like different things. You can change your star rating, competitor star ratings. Like it, it's really cool. Um, but we've been doing something basically like what Intellivy has been doing for years. We just had our graphic designers mock up uh, Amazon search results. And then we were using Amazon MTurk uh, to actually do it because it's it's so much cheaper. Um, and with MTurk, you can actually put one of your settings as an Amazon customer who has bought in a certain category within a certain time frame. So we know we're getting people that bought within the protein bar space within the last like 90 days. So should be a pretty engaged customer for our audience. And we try and get a few thousand people through. It, it literally takes an hour, maybe like two hours to get that many people through. And Amazing. we'll test like six or seven different things. And then we'll run split tests on Amazon with them. So you're using the A-B testing feature on Amazon itself, the manager experiments feature? So so we are. Um, we used to do a lot of it manually. And it just, it, it gets too hard to keep track of all of it, to be honest. Um, so we're, we're relying on Amazon to do that. The, the big piece that kind of when we were doing it ourselves, we couldn't figure out is we don't know like when the peak traffic times on it are on Amazon. Like we obviously can guess right. like, Hey, Mondays are awesome. Things like that. But we don't know what's happening in specific categories or how it's all kind of correlating down. So yes, we can switch out the price, the images and things like that. But you can't really get a correlation to any of that since we don't know the other variables that are there. We're hoping that Amazon takes those variables into consideration when they are doing these tests and that way we'll get a little bit better results from them. Yeah. Makes sense. What all do you let Amazon test for you? Is it just the images? Are you doing copy? What, what all are you having Amazon test for you using the experiments feature? Yeah. So for us, it's mainly images and titles. Um, what we've seen and, and we've tested this, we've launched products with no content besides images and titles, and you can still rank for everything. You can still get sales. It, it does not matter. And really, yeah, the, the big thing that I think people forget as an Amazon seller is take some time on like the app or the site and actually just be, be a buyer, put yourself in their shoes. If you go to any product on mobile, the bullet points are like, three quarters of the way down the page. No one, no one's fucking reading your bullet points. No one yep. cares. Yep. Yeah. It's very true. A lot of that copy and so far down, and then you're just going to blow, you know, blow right through it when you do get to it anyways. Kind of looks exactly. like the small fine print, like terms and conditions, right? Of the product anyways. Um, yep. Fascinating. That, that makes a lot of sense. How do you test price then? Yeah, so uh, we actually use a um, software for this called Eva uh, Guru. They've been at a couple of events, actually. I think they were at Billion Dollar Seller Summit. Um, they were amazing. We actually started working with them because we had a client that has over a million SKUs that they actively have to keep pricing oh my like, up on. Yeah, and it's like a lot of it is they're they they're reselling other parts and things like that. So we're, we're constantly competing for buy box, but they do have a lot of their own, I think, like 300,000 private label items that 
we just want to maximize price on Amazon as much as possible. So they have some awesome tools that really they some of the smartest repricing I've ever seen where you can set it like, hey, increase my price by this percentage every two days. But if you see declining sales, like revert back to this price until you see it steady again. And like it'll do all kinds of crazy things. Um, so can't recommend it enough. And for the price, I, I think it's one of the cheapest repricers out there um, for really anyone, even if you're small or large. That's fantastic. I know you've you've shared a lot of tools already. So you have Eva Guru, correct? Mm -hmm. That's the, the correct. repricing tool. Is that EVA? Uh, yes, it's EVA.Guru. Okay, EVA.Guru. Okay, yep. and just want to go through these just to make sure I'm on the same page, but also so that our listeners can make sure that like, wait, did I hear that correctly? <laughs> um, Intellivy was another one that you talked about, right? Correct. Yep. So I N T E L L E V E E. I'm assuming or something uh, along that line. It is I N T E L L I V Y dot net is the website. Okay. Dot and this one's pretty new. It just came or it was just released like to the general public. I think a few weeks ago. Ooh, amazing! We're getting that yeah. hot off the press. Yeah. yeah, I love I love that you know all all of these amazing <laughs> software tools. Um, and then you also mentioned Interc. What was that? Um, so it's actually something from Amazon. So Interc is Amazon's micro worker network, Amazon Mechanical Turk. Um, okay. You can just sign up, um, create an account, and basically you can pay whatever you want to do these little micro tasks. So we used to use this for all kinds of things, to be honest. Like we used to use it for add to carts back in the day or like upvotes on reviews because it was Amazon accounts. Um, <laughs> but you can pay like a penny for people to do this and get thousands of responses for like 10, 20 bucks. Interesting. MTurk is what you said, yep. right? It's just MTurk.com. Okay. Easy enough. Awesome. Matt, what are some other softwares that are maybe... New softwares, what are some of the software tools that you have been using that you use to manage these multiple brands that you guys are managing as in your agency? Yeah, so um, obviously I think we touched on earlier PacView. We use PacView for everything. Um, we, we've tried a lot of the softwares out there. Um, we don't really care for a lot of the AI ones because I, I don't believe there's any true AI software in the Amazon advertising space. It's all fluff. Um, <laughs> it's basically just a rule set that they're applying based on whatever's happening, which you can do the same and create your own manual rules that will be way better. Um, so that's why we ended up with PacView because they allow you to not only use that AI if you want to, but you can set your own manual rules and really dig into things. Um, we also use Data Dive like daily. Uh, Brandon Young's tool. Uh, I cannot say enough good things about that. I think you probably use it as well. Like yeah. anyone that's anyone in the space is using Data Dive. Um, it, it saves hours upon hours of work for us. Yep, makes sense. Yep. Makes yeah. sense. I'm trying to think of uh, an ecom analytics. Um, we, we use that quite a bit as well because they do before the search query report, they were the best way to pull like estimated sales from the brand analytics data. I'm not exactly sure how they were calculating it, but it was pretty close. Um, so we, we used it quite a bit. Fascinating. Those are some yeah. awesome tools. I know I've already got a few takeaways from this. We just recently started using PackView, and we've been loving it as well. Just, the amount of data that we can access now, the amount of like control that we have, being able to establish rules, do this when this happens, do that when that happens, um, has been amazing. So I, I, I recommend PackView as well. So let's rewind and go all the way back to PPC, right? Mm -hmm. So you're starting with these two campaigns. We talked about the exact campaigns. We got off on a tangent of product <laughs> optimization from hey, if your conversion rate is not where it should be, and that's the key thing that I think you've summed up so well, Matt, is like you're just looking at the conversion rate. And then you do all that troubleshooting if your conversion rate isn't up to par. Yep. Then what? what's the next approach, Matt? Let's assume our conversion rate is we're you know 10%. We're meeting that minimum that our other competitors have. Where do we go from there after those first 30 days? 
Yeah, so then it, it really comes down to, again, actually some of the same steps. We're, we're still pulling that impression share report. Are we maximizing our impressions? Can we can we spend more on this keyword and potentially get more sales? Um, so we say we, we are converting well, but we're only getting like 35% of the impression share. We'll bump that up and look, okay, we increased our impression share last week by like 20 percentage points. What was our actual like increase in sales for that keyword? Um, you used to not be able to know this. You had to guess, but you can use the search query report now and figure out your organic sales plus your um, ad sales for that week. And you can see, okay, incrementally, I spent this much more to get that 20% more share. Is it actually quantifying out as more dollars in my pocket or a higher run rate for me as a whole? Um, so that makes it super easy. If we continue to see that, we're like, all right, um, let, let's keep spending um, and we'll keep bumping things up from there as much as possible. Um, only time we really back off is if we're ranked like number one, uh, but and a lot of the categories we're in, if you are ranked number one and you pull back ads for a couple of days, you instantly fall to like number four or five because really? you, you just lose some sales. Um, so we're, we're constantly checking that. We actually, we use PackView to manage that. They actually have a, if my organic rank drops below this, increase my bid kind of role, which is awesome because we were having someone pull it in Helium 10, drop it in a spreadsheet, and then they were uploading bulk files and it was a pain in the ass. That, that would be a lot of work. <laughs> yep. Um, so from that point on, it really kind of flows into our kind of steady state. And for us, steady state is different than what I think most people do. Uh, and this goes for every, not even my own products, but every product we manage in the agency. We're trying to get people to get out of that mindset of ACOS and tacos and direct ROI on ads because Amazon is turning more into really it's it's a brand dominated space and you have to build the audience build the brand and continue to grow that and that costs money um so like one of our kind of hero brands that i'll actually share a, a case study over with you afterwards and we can kind of run through some of it here but they came on with us about a year year and a half ago uh they were doing about ten thousand dollars a month in sales we'll close out this month at about 5.7 million um, wow and the main difference is they came to us saying, we want to have like a 15% ACOS. And I'm like, yeah, we can do that, but you're leaving so much on the table. And basically the, the founder came to me like mid COVID and they were just like, Hey, we, we've got this much money left. We've got to make this work. If it doesn't work, like the company's going to fold, what should we do? And I was like, all right, well, we can easily spend three, four hundred thousand dollars a month on ads. We had been spending two hundred thousand up until this point. Um, started spending that that month, raised it to one hundred and fifty the first month, about two twenty five the next, and then about three fifty in the third month. What we saw is, yeah, our our ACAS was one hundred and twenty, one hundred and thirty percent, but our repeat purchase on these customers was almost sixty seven percent. So wow, we were okay. acquiring people for. Um, I mean, it, it all goes back to, to what, what the price of your product is. They were selling a $19 product. So 120% ACOS is really only like a $23, $24 CPA, which if you're sending traffic to your Shopify site, like I would take that CPA any day. Sure. Um, so we related it all back to that and we're seeing, all right, as long as this person continues to purchase for this many months, this is what our profit will be. And we really kind of hedged and estimated our LTV of a customer at that point. And we spent towards LTV. As long as on LTV we were break even, we were just spending money. And like our A cost was two, three hundred percent some months, like straight up. Um, but now we're we're running at a steady state of about a hundred percent A cost across all their products a year later. Uh, we're acquiring around twelve thousand new subscribers a month on our products. That's not all, not people that repeat purchase, but people that actually subscribe and save. And then our repeat purchase rate is still above 40%. So amazing. It, it's, it's absolutely dominating. We have over a million and a half dollars in subscribe and saves that go out every single month. And they're just like, continue to spend. Like if we can keep spending more, let's, let's spend. And it works. No, I, I love that. And I guess the reason why that works to be able to be willing to basically acquire customers at a loss is because you know the data behind it, right? You can project what that lifetime value of a customer is. You've got subscribe and save. So I would assume this is a replenishable product, right? That Correct. People need. Yep. But we, we've also 
flip the same strategy into non-replenishable products. So we, we have a lot. I mean, I would call them like semi-replenishable. You might buy it every like two years when you break the one that you have kind of thing. Okay. Um, but it's the same math and model that goes into it with just a little bit of a tweak. And basically we were estimating this before, but with the search query report, you can pull all this data and figure it out. We know exactly how many organic sales are happening for every single keyword. We know if you're ranking organically for those keywords, this is what you should potentially get in sales weekly. So our entire process for products that aren't super replenishable is, hey, I'm okay spending at a 150, 200% ACoS if I can maintain that number one or number two organic ranking because I know it's going to pay me back on these sales um, from those rankings. And we run everything based off of that model and use a lot of those, like if I'm in this position, decrease my bid. And we kind of ride out those top organic placements until they start to drop. Um, so we'll pause our ads if we're in position one or two. And then we'll turn them back on once we're like in position four or five. And we just keep riding that wave. And that's how you you make that profitable. Interesting. So you're willing to just kind of like stay in that one or two position, even though you're losing money on the front end. Right. And but you know that that's boosting your organic rankings <laughs> across other keywords. Right. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately you're you're counting on the fact that like it's you're just getting more money down the road, right? Like, do you run into cash flow issues that way, you know, with some of these brands? And, and what do you do about that, right? Because it does take money up front. That money goes out the door real quick with ad yep. spend. Um, yeah, so I, I would say we, we do from time to time. Um, obviously, putting it all on credit cards, um, American Express Gold is like our preferred because the Forex rewards. And yep. if you spend over 150 k I, that's like when the forex stops you can just open more like multiple we have like 40 employee cards that we just we keep rotating our ad spend through so we keep getting that forex multiplier um, you get it so you get that for every employee card that you add to that it adds on 150,000 for every employee card that you add that's wicked smart because yeah, yeah. We, we even for ourselves like we max that out pretty quick and then we're i'm i'm gonna need to sign up a bunch of employee cards uh -huh. Yeah, so like my, my grandma's got one, my grandpa's got one, I've got cousins that have got it. Like they're they're all just running through our company. <laughs> I love it. I love yeah. it. Okay, that's a good that's uh, a great ninja hack, everybody. Maximize those reward points on Amazon. Yep. So we're delaying as much as we can there. Um yeah. and this is like our own personal strategy. This is how I do it. And then uh we have an AMX plum card. You can actually use your plum card through a relationship with bill.com that they have to ACH money to vendors that you're working with. So we pay our gold cards with our plum card, which then gives you another 60 days to basically pay your ad spend. So we're looking at like 90 to 120 days on average is when we're like having to actually pay those ad bills without really? taking okay. any loans or anything like that. It's just arbitraging these credit cards. You do pay a slight percentage on the like uh, bill.com, like ACH through the credit card. I, I think it's like 1.2, 1.3%, but okay. it, it, it's nothing. We just add that into our, our cost of advertising. Yeah, that that's super smart. So what's the plum card? That's just a new uh, is that uh, the card offering so, from Amex. Yes, yeah, so they've had it for a while. Most people don't go for it because it actually doesn't give you rewards points. Um, it will give you a discount if you pay off your bill in full each month. I forget what that percentage is. We don't actually ever use it for that. Okay. Um, but it gives you 60 days basically to pay whatever the bill is with no interest. So it's made for small businesses that may have to carry sums for longer than what your average credit card period is. Okay. So you're you're basically transferring the balance or you're paying off that balance from the gold cards to the plum cards, correct? Correct. Okay. And then eventually then you'll pay off the plum cards within 60 days. Yep. So yeah. So you're getting basically depending on when you spend like 35 to 40 days on the gold card and then 60 days on the plum. Um, yeah. And the nice thing with the Plum is it's not a rolling billing period like most credit cards. It's actually from the day you spent that money. So if you mm. spend $1,000 on the 1st of October, you don't have to pay that back until the 1st of December. And it's only that $1,000 even if you spent $100,000 in October. Brilliant. That's yeah. amazing. Yep. That, that is a 
fantastic like cash flow hack. I'm going to have to add this now to the beginning of the podcast to say, hey, now we've all we're including like cash flow um, information because I think that's uh, so many people overlook that and it becomes a challenge real quick for brands yeah. that are growing rapidly. And so being able to do that without, you know, I think there's there's a lot of financing partners out there in the Amazon space now, as we all know. But my goodness, like if you take a look at the interest rates, like it's it's beyond ridiculous. And it, this it basically you're like one percent for, you know, 90 to, you know, maybe 100 days. Right. Yep. And, and I mean, I'll preface that with saying like it, it is high risk, like if your account gets suspended or anything happens, like. Obviously, you could have some pretty high interest rates, um, but it, it works well for us. Yeah, no, that that's great. Thanks, yep. thanks for sharing that, Matt. Yeah, um, um, but basically, like even on smaller products, say you like we just launched a product here recently with about a twenty thousand dollar budget. Um, it was well below kind of a lot of our thresholds, but we just wanted to prove a point because someone was like, "Well, your product's only successful because you're putting this much money behind it." And, losing money for four months to to make money at the end. Um, and what we did is if you have a small budget, a lot of times people go for way too many keywords still. Like I see it time and time again, they either go for super small keywords, which you can do um, like under 1500, to like 3,500 searches a month. Like, yeah, you can do that. You can rank for those, but it's going to take a very long time to actually build your sales up. And yeah. by the time um, you do get to that point where you can start to spend some money, your honeymoon period's gone. All the stuff that helps you rank with the big boys from the beginning is gone. Um, so what we would tend to do in a strategy like that is pick one major keyword that's getting at least like 30 to 40,000 searches a month. And that is all we would go for on that entire launch. And we know if we can rank in the top five for that keyword, you're going to pick up an extra six, 700 sales per month organically. And all of those small keywords that you're going to target anyways that have that one in it, you're going to rank for them. It happens yeah. every single time. So we were able to, to launch a supplement. Um, it, was, it was a $20,000 ad budget for basically three months. And we were able to rank it number one for the keyword we were going after. And we picked up, actually, I can check it right now. 35 other number one positions um, wow. with that for a total of 142,000 search uh, volume in the top 10 per month. Amazing. Mm -hmm. So everything you've talked about thus far, you're just focused on Amazon launches only PPC on Amazon. Are you doing any external marketing? Because I know you guys are very well experienced when it comes to the marketing game. Are you doing anything with the external traffic to get those type of results? Yeah, so we, we do. Um, we, we run Facebook ads um, for launches. We do emails. Uh, we do Google ads a lot, just ongoing constantly. Um, really, we're, we're mixing any type of media we can in. Uh, but the biggest one that I'm actually most excited for, and we, we just started doing this a little bit deeper, is um, affiliates. So mm. big thing with Amazon Associates or affiliates is Amazon cut their commissions tremendously. I think it was like a year and a half ago from like seven to 10% to like one to 3%. It's basically nothing. Um, so Refersion, which is actually, I think now owned by uh, the same people that unpack you and Helium 10, they created a new Amazon version that allows you to link in your um, brand referral bonus and hand out affiliate codes to Amazon influencers through your brand referral. And not only can you basically pay them like, whatever percentage you want, but like you can add kickers onto it. You can do sweepstakes and things like that, depending on like who refers the most sales that month and really push those buttons. Um, so I think it's going to be a huge game changer. We've only been doing it for a few weeks now and we're, we're already seeing great results in the products that we're putting it up against. Um, so probably a lot to come in that space and will be a number one spot that you kind of want to push things out to. Um, the, Actually, the, the main reason we got into this is we did due diligence for a acquisition about seven months ago. And through the process, what we found is this product that um, they were trying to sell this company for, I think they exited for almost half a billion dollars, maybe a little bit more. Uh, they were constantly outselling everyone else that had the exact same product by like 60 to 70,000 units a month. And we, wow. we couldn't figure it out for the life of us. And what ended up happening is we actually went to SEMrush and pulled all the backlinks for their product. 
they were ranking number one in Google for so many freaking keywords because of their affiliate game for their D2C site that mm. they had almost 80,000 people per month from Google clicking out to their Amazon listing. And that's where every single sale was coming from. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So affiliates were, were driving all of that, right? Yeah. With Refersion, and again, I, I've been introduced to Refersion recently as well. As you've gotten started there, did you have to go and find the affiliates or did you just, you know, post your offer on Refersion and allow, you know, whoever wanted to kind of sign up there? Because I know running affiliate programs is no small task, right? Like that's a job in and of itself and recruiting and maintaining and creating games yep. and, uh, you know, you know, challenges to incentivize people it, what have you experienced thus far? I know it's really new for you. Yeah, so so we did both. Um, the good thing um, that we were kind of lucky with with Right Set Up is we actually have an entire affiliate team. Um, so we already have a quiver of top performing affiliates that we work with across all different verticals. Uh, so that that made it a lot easier for us to enter. But yeah, this is a hundred percent a full time job, and it's like I mean, you're you're basically selling yourself to these affiliates twenty four seven and constantly yep. just trying to stay top of mind. It is extremely hard to do, and it's extremely hard to get the big ones because everyone will pay them more and more. Um, but at the end of the day, what we've realized is sometimes it's worth just literally paying them like crazy percentages. Like on some of our supplements, we'll pay them like 90% of the sale just because of the traffic they can produce and what that does for us elsewhere. Fascinating. Yeah, so really yeah. incentivizing that front-end purchase, knowing that you've got a funnel to capitalize on that. Now, talking about that funnel to capitalize on that lifetime value of a customer, is there anything that you do with product inserts or, you know, getting people's emails? Like, how do you maximize that lifetime value if you're giving away the farm, so to speak, on that front end sale? Yeah, so we, we do we do inserts on just about every single product or some sort of like call out for a lead gen. Um, the big one that we've been doing here recently is um, the um, NFC chips, um, not NFTs, NFCs, the little thing <laughs> on your credit card that lets you like tap it. Um, because like it used to be huge to do the uh, like supplements. I'm sure if anyone's bought a supplement on Amazon in the last like three years, it's like go here to get a second bottle for free. Like yeah. everyone does that. Yeah. Um, we're basically doing a very similar offer, but with an NFC chip that's hidden under the label. So they don't realize it, but NFC chips, as soon as your phone's near that bottle, it's going to pop up and say there's something near and people are going to click that because they're like, what the hell is near me that's making this happen? <laughs> um, so we've had great results with that. Um, I would highly, highly suggest it. it. They're dirt cheap. Like we thought it was going to be expensive. They're like a tenth of a cent a piece to order these from China. Really? And, oh yeah, super cheap. Um, and you can stick them on literally anything and everything. They're just like little little stickers. Um, so super easy to implement. So we just send them straight to a landing page and collect the information. Um, we also do do um, direct mail still. Uh, still works very well for us across our brands. Our average like age is 54 plus on most of our, like okay. my personal products that I sell. So they still convert extremely well. Um, the other thing that we were doing, it's gotten harder now because Amazon's like blocked a lot of the data on both like full addresses and customer names. We used to scrape those and do like data appends through a third party data service so we could try and retarget those people on like Facebook or other yeah. Uh, platforms. Yeah. What yeah. Uh, with that, I think those are brilliant strategies. What's your offer right now using um, the NFC chips right now? What is your offer? Is it still get a bottle free, but you're just using the NFC chip or what? what's the offer? Yeah, so for us right now, um, it, it depends. Um, so it, it rotates through a few things. Uh, there are some free offers. It basically takes them to like some sort of contest page and we do give away free bottles. We aren't doing it. Um, I would say we're, we're trying to keep it as kosher with Amazon as possible. Yeah. Um, so like, yes, there is a chance to win a free bottle. Yes. Like a lot of people win free bottles. Um, but th there's other chances for coupons and, and things like that. And then what we're doing from there is once we have their, their phone number or their email address, we're pinging them within that first week and basically giving them an offer that's valid on both our D2C site as well as Amazon. 
And whichever offer they pick from that email is basically how we communicate to them in the future. So if they pick our D2C site, we're always going to send them to D2C. If they pick Amazon, we're always going to send them to Amazon from there on out. Because we tested this a bunch on super large lists that we had. And what we found is when we gave them both offers, people don't like choice. Um, like oh. it converts way less if you give them the choice of which one to go to versus just telling them, here's the offer, here's where it's at. Um, so use that first email, get their preference. If they don't interact with that first email, they basically keep getting an iteration of that email until they react to one and then they'll kind of follow our flows from there. Interesting. Yeah, I love yeah. that. So on that point, how much do you spend, you know, focused on your D2C website, right? Especially as it relates to like affiliate traffic, right? I think a lot of people would say, oh, well, Amazon's just going to take, you know, a lot of your money. So why send people to Amazon, right? Now we have the brand referral bonus now. But prior to that, or even with that today, people would still make the argument of, oh, you'll have better margins. Just send them directly to your D2C shop. So Sounds like you have both going on. So what's your kind of strategy and recommendation there, Matt? Yeah. So for us, it it really comes down to the way that you view Amazon. And I think a lot of people just look straight at like sales in, sales out. What are my fees? That that means nothing. Amazon is a search arbitrage channel. It's not a search demand creator. You are arbitraging what's already there. If you are not ranking well for a keyword, you can't arbitrage. So no matter what, like say I'm paying an affiliate an extremely high commission plus the Amazon fees, like it's all a cost of business on Amazon. It's all an ad. As long as it meets my CPA thresholds, I'm going to continue to do that because the more you can push sales through Amazon, the higher you're going to rank organically, the more you're going to benefit from just that traffic flywheel that Amazon allows you to arbitrage. So we're agnostic to where you go. Like, we don't care. As long as you're coming to us and buying, if you're like our, our main brand sells in Whole Foods, we're in Walmart, we're in Amazon, D2C, Instacart. I don't care where you're buying us from. I just want you to be thinking of us and buy. That, that's it. So we'll touch you on every channel and whichever one you want to go to, that's your choice. Makes, makes sense. So with affiliates, you're you're allowing them to kind of give multiple links or are you trying to push more towards Amazon or do you have like a preference? Yeah, so it, it really depends on the affiliate. Like I think this is where it gets super detailed on affiliate marketing is yeah. you need to look at who their audience is. You need to look at, okay, this is that age range. Where does that age range go to shop? Where are they going to see me? How am I going to pitch this offer to them? And really tailoring it that to that specific niche. Uh, so for like all of our affiliates, they will only send to one site uh, per campaign. Most of the time it's either Amazon or our D2C site. Uh, I would say like, usually it's like 70% Amazon just because we see like, we, we just did a campaign last week and I'm looking right now, our keywords in the top 10 for our main product went from 71 to 145, uh, with wow. over 1.2 million search volume now in the top 10 just from that affiliate push. So yes, it cost me like $30,000 to do that, but the sales this week will probably do five, 6,000 units a day on that one listing for the next week and a half. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, you've got so much experience and you see so much data there. You've, you've got 12 years of experience, so you know your stuff. Matt, you've got a wealth of knowledge. You've already shared so much um, with us today. For our audience, they're established sellers, right? They're looking to go to that next level. They want to break into eight figures and beyond. So, Matt, with your experience, you've done a lot of due diligence for some huge brands as well. What is it that you would recommend for those people that want to move to eight figures and beyond? What should they be focused on? Yeah, so I uh, actually get this question a lot. And I think the biggest thing is a lot of us as Amazon sellers get caught up in our day to day and we kind of get like, you, you get a taste of success and you get this superiority complex, like happened to me, happened to a lot of people that I know. And at, at the end of the day, that's that's only going to cause problems. Um, it's when you start kind of twiddling your thumbs and you're, you're doing stupid things like, should I add this product to this variation? Should I add this color? And like, none of these are going to move the needle incrementally in your business. Like you can add 20 different colors. It's not going to make a difference. Um, so 
really focusing on new products and launching new products. We try and launch four to five new products a month. And if they don't perform, we kill them within three months. Like it's a very quick to market, quick to kill. And what we've seen though is Amazon favors that like all of our old products will get a huge boost when we are consistently launching new products on that brand. Really? Um, mm -hmm. Like tremendous bumps. It's, it's actually really surprising. And if you read some of the, the Amazon like science papers, I, I don't know if you've ever gone there. Uh, it's like Amazon sciences. If you Google it, you can find it. Um, and then search for, I think it's called cold starts. Um, just search cold start and you'll find it, but it's basically, a white paper on the patent and how the algorithm works for Amazon. And one of the key things is how many new products is this brand launching? Um, mm -hmm. So they're, they're weighing that in and they're looking at as a brand, how many units do you sell on a monthly basis? How is that increasing month over month? So as long as you're launching new products, that should always be somewhat increasing. So you, you get favorable um, benefit from Amazon, but the other big piece that I've seen, and, and this is something that we just, I would say like, yeah, it's probably been about a year now that we finally figured this out. And it was like, man, why did we not think of this before? So like pretend you're, you're selling in the garden niche and you sell like one of those extendable hoses because I see those everywhere. <laughs> um, at the end of the day, if you continue to launch products in that niche, you're going to launch, let's do like an attachment for the hose, like a, a spray nozzle you're going to have an overlapping keyword subsegment of like 78 to 80% of your keywords because right. a lot of those products are, come with a free attachment. It's like their they're free offer when you buy the product kind of thing. What we do now, and we use Datadive and actually a couple other tools to do this, but we look and see, okay, um, right now, how many keywords are we ranking in the top 10 for for this entire brand? What are those keywords? here's the 30 products in our product opportunity list the top sellers for each of those keywords or each of those like sub segments where are they ranking and what is that overlapping keyword relevancy so we're now instead of launching like the next logical product as of that hose attachment we're going to go to like a garden kneeling stance it's still in the same vertical you can still brand it under the same brand but that's almost a hundred percent like non-competing search traffic Mm. And you're basically in a roundabout way, increasing your traffic back to your original listing, because if you're buying like a kneeling stand for the garden, more than likely you're going to need a hose at some point. So you're just continuing to build your brand kind of outreach through these new products without overlapping the same customers that you currently have. Yeah. And you're, and you would kind of advise against trying to create products that overlap on the same keywords, because then you just start, you know, eating away, I guess, some cannibalization, right? And then you start destroying your own organic ranking. Is that correct? Yeah. So like our, our main brand, we, we sell low carb keto snacks. If you search keto snack, like we buy the top like four ad placements 90% of the day, every day, um, because all of our products kind of relate to their one product in that like line of, I think we have seven keto products. Now one product gets 80% of the sales for that keyword no matter mm -hmm. what we do. It doesn't matter if we switch the ad spend to higher on the ones that don't normally get those sales, it still goes to that one. So we're, we're kind of like stepping away from keto products now as a whole and working on different like dietary restrictions just to extend our reach a bit more, but it try and make it as varied as possible. Yeah. Fascinating. Well, yeah. I think another game changer, and I've never heard somebody talk about this, but as part of Amazon's ranking algorithm, like launching products is a component of that. I've never, I've never heard that before, but I believe it. I, I sounds logical to me. And again, that's what Amazon wants, right? They want brands to be bringing new products to their channel. Amazon wants to stay relevant. They want to be, you know, the place people always go to instead of, you know, becoming an afterthought. So love that. I think that's a huge mindset shift for a lot of sellers of just keep feeding the Amazon beast bringing out new products and then going back to, you know, you, you're quick to launch and then you're quick to kill uh, after 90 days, Matt, you know, how do you make that determination of like, yep, this product's not going to cut it. We're just going to kill it. What are the metrics that you use to make that call? Because I think all of us, you know, and again, sometimes it's an emotional attachment to the mm -hmm. product for a lot of sellers. It's like, Oh, I believe in this. I know I can make it work. Like, 
you have a case study or two that you could share that's like, here's the product, like it wasn't meeting these criteria. We did all of the optimization stuff that we talked about earlier in this podcast, still didn't work, and we killed it, right? Do you have anything you could share there? Yeah, so we peg everything to like a net return at after like four to five months, and we want to hit a certain number for us. We, our products have to make us at least like 75, sometimes 100,000 a month, okay. or we, we don't want to continue launching it or even like, paying to play in that position because we know we can launch another product that will get us there and we don't have to worry. Um, so that that's the first thing. If after like three to four months, it's not hitting those targets or we're just not like mainly because you're not like sticking your organic keywords, it it's just not worth it to continue to, to pay to battle that because we, we aren't really getting any true benefit from it if we're constantly spending a ton on ads for it. Yeah. Um, the second thing is actually user um, feedback. So we we strive on having like premium products and we want to make sure that hey if our product is not the best that's on the market we're we're going to take it off um we actually we launched a keto gummy uh did extremely well back in march we were selling almost 2000 units a day across three flavors um we ended up killing it 3 months in because we were kept getting feedback from our customers that like hey like there's something wrong with this. Like we don't like the texture of it. It's just like, it's uh -huh. too sticky, this and that. And we could see that our, our reviews were already starting to drop. We were like, I think we had over a thousand reviews at that point. And we were slowly ticking down like 0.1 each week. And I was like, all right, we're, we're going to hit like three stars in this product. It's going to happen. So we figured, all right, we will kill it. Uh, and we lost, this is when I think we lost almost $300,000 on. We killed it. We destroyed all the inventory. We had 20,000 units still left. Um, wow. And we reformulated it and we're getting ready to relaunch it here um, the end of next month. But for us, it's like, hey, this brand is selling well across multiple products. If this is your first interaction with our brand, you're never going to want to try another one of our products. And we, we don't want to be putting that foot forward. So up front, it cost us a lot, but in the long run, it would have cost us 10 times as much. Yeah. I think that that's a brilliant takeaway there, right? Because you're not just focused on, hey, I've got to make sales on this product, which I think so many people, when they launch a product, it's like, I only care about just making money on this. And they exclude or they forget about the overall brand appearance, right? And as you so eloquently, you know, disseminated it to us, you've got to understand that this is a much bigger picture. Amazon is moving into the whole brand space. You've got to be bringing a brand to the table. Kevin King was on the podcast. That's the one thing he talked about. He's like, you've got to create an experience with the customer. Long gone yep. are the days of just slapping a logo or a brand name on a product and hoping that it sells well. You got to create this cohesive experience and you've established that with a lot of your examples here today. Matt. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I've got Another question I want to ask you, but I didn't want to cut you off there. Did you have something else you wanted to add on to that? Oh, yeah. The, the only other thing that I was going to say is, um, so we've been doing a lot of testing now with like this, like build the brand out as much as possible. Um, the big piece on like those brand engagement emails, I don't know if you guys have sent any of these, but we've been doing the repeat customers, recent customers, and like high spenders. All of our previous emails, when we just had that one, only to followers, we were lucky if we got one sale. Our yeah. last four emails have all produced over $30,000 in sales. Wow. So you've been yeah. seeing success with the new kind of emails that Amazon's allowing us to send out. Yep. That's great. I think that's a great component. And I think, as you can see, Amazon's leaning more into this giving the brands more tools to communicate to customers, which is good which is good. So yeah. Matt, as we wrap things up here today, I love to leave the audience with three actionable takeaways from each episode. Here are three takeaways that I noted, Matt. So let me know if I'm missing something. I mean, we could go, this list could honestly be like a hundred <laughs> takeaways from <laughs> today, but the three that I kind of highlighted, and these are big overarching themes, and then you could, you know, dive deeper into these. But I think, Number one takeaway is you have to be launching new products aggressively, right? Quick yep. to launch and then quick to kill products. That's your number one takeaway. If you're not focused on finding your next new product, you're already behind the eight ball. 
you should always have a pipeline of, you know, 18 months, two years, three years worth of products that you know you're going to be coming out with. Number two is focused on PPC optimization when launching a product and getting and getting rid of the whole thought process of what's my ACOS, what's my tacos percentage. Remove that and focus more on what is my conversion rate for those specific keywords and how is that comparing to my competitors. And you can see all of that data in brand analytics. I think that's a big mindset shift that people need to implement today with their PPC campaigns because you could forever spend money on a keyword, but if your your conversion rate's bad, well, good luck trying to improve that performance of that, right? Yep. Um, and then last thing that I have here um, as an action item is optimization. And one of the first things that you should be doing in terms of product optimization is focused on that primary image. And then depending on where Amazon goes with this, you know, flipping to a first and second image in the search results, focus on that primary image and then even your secondary image, making sure that it's readable, it's easy to understand, quick hit, somebody can look at it within a second, they understand what that product's about, conveys a lot of value to them, and differentiating yourselves. Um, then we have a lot of software tools that you you shared with us as well to be able to implement many of these tactics here today, Matt. Did I sum things up properly? Anything else that you would add that I missed? Uh, no, I, I, I think you hit it all. Um, I think the, the only other thing that I would add is really step back from your business and, and think um, strategically about what you're doing in your day to day. Uh, we did this a couple years ago and actually found out I was the bottleneck and like 90% of everything that was either not getting done or getting like tossed to the side for that period. Um, and really either hire good talent that you can remove yourself from those pieces or rework the way that you're doing some of these processes to remove yourself in that bottleneck because it's, you don't realize where most of your time's going throughout the day and it, you get stuck doing the same stuff that doesn't really actually move the needle. Yep. I could 100% agree with you on that statement. I think us as entrepreneurs battle with that on an ongoing basis. And you move into something new and you start figuring that out and you have to do that time study and start offloading, delegating more and, and continue climbing and, and moving on further. Great takeaway. Matt, my final question for you is who in the e-commerce space should people be paying attention to or following you know, to stay up to date with the latest trends or to stay ahead of the game when it comes to ranking on Amazon, who would you recommend as, as some people to pay attention to? Yeah. Um, honestly, I, I think Brandon Young puts out some of the, the best content in the space. I, like my, my issue with a lot of the, the gurus out there is they aren't actually doing anything that they talk about. Like Brandon's in the trenches. He'll tell you like what's happening and very honest about it. Um, his group is great as well. Um, from an ads perspective, um, I think Destiny over at Better AMS is always pumping out great content 24-7, whether it's like on Facebook or LinkedIn. They're, they're doing some awesome things. Um, and I'm trying to think if there's anyone else outside of that. Not many else that we're looking at right now. Yep. I think both of those are some great names. And again, Brandon Young will be a future podcast guest, so we look forward to sharing or hearing his insights as well. But Matt, thank you so much for your time. Uh, this was a lot of valuable information. Where can people go to learn more about you, uh, your agency? And I think you also have a free gift as like a free audit that you were going to give people, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so you can find out more about us and our agency just uh, by going to uh, rightsideup.com. Um, and if you fill out the contact us form down below, we, we are offering free audits, um, to anyone that listens to the podcast. So just mention that and we'll go ahead and get that taken care of for you. Awesome. Thanks again for joining us, Matt. And we'll chat with you again soon. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening. Visit ecombreakthrough.com for more information. If you've enjoyed today's episode, the best way you can show your appreciation is by clicking the subscribe button and quickly leaving a review. See you again next time.